Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ebro in the morning, and Ebro, uh, being the cornball that he is, is in. He was very upset that the way this timing worked out, that he happens to be in Vail, Colorado, oh, right now. Is he seriously snowboarding? Yes. yes. Is that for real? Yes. yes. I thought you guys were kidding. No. no. He is legitimately just snowboarding. All I weekend. honestly thought he lost a bet. And the consequence of losing the bet is that you guys are going to make up this whole story about how he's a snowboarder now nope. in order to ruin his reputation. No, no, no he's so out real. there. He's it's... out there broing it up, <laughs> snowboarding. But we're very excited to have Rachel Maddow back yeah. on the show. Hey. And what, what great timing it is because we, we were, were so excited to talk to you through this terrible, crazy time we've been living through. We need someone to help. Help us cope. Help us understand <laughs> right. what's happening. I'm not right. good as emotional support. I'll tell you that. No, you like, actually I've, scare me more, to yeah. be honest, when I watch your show. I wind people up. I don't calm people <laughs> down. Okay, so, so let's let's start with the obvious biggest news of this very moment, which is Jeff Sessions uh, recusing himself in the Russia investigation. S let's simplify this for people. W what are we suggesting ultimately that, that Sessions was legitimately meeting with Russian operatives and talking Trump business and trying to help his campaign? Like, what, or, or is it just the fact that he had any meeting with Russia and lied about it is such a blatant violation that he has to recuse himself? You're, you're, you're totally on the important distinction here. There's two important things. There's the one big, scary, keep you up at night. Literally, it wakes me up in the middle of the night when I have, like, my, when my dreamscape intrudes into this territory, and that is... What the hell were all these people doing talking to the Russian government while the Russian government right. was affecting our election? Right. That's like the Manchurian candidate, super scary national security stuff. Uh, so let's put that aside for a second. Okay. The other side of it is, why is it that all these people in the Trump campaign, it's um, Jeff Sessions, it's the national security advisor, mm -hmm. now it's also his son-in-law, Jared. Like, why is it that all of these people met with Russians during the campaign and then forgot it? I mean, all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, and they, I mean, Reince Priebus has come out, Sean Spicer's come out, Mike Pence has come yeah. out, and they all said categorically, no one from the campaign met with Russians. No one, not a single person. That's absurd. And it turns out they all did. And each day we get a new revelation of somebody who did, and they also forgot it. And they also have an explanation for why they forgot it. Well, that's weird. Like, if, it, it's, if it's no big deal, why have you all been lying about right. it? Right. Well, let's, let's right. start here. When you're at home and you're thinking about, the things that it could be. And I'm trying to pull up this great thing my cousin, who's brilliant, posted about how many names there were. Oh, here it is. The amount of Trump names that were are suspiciously connected to Russia in total, which is a just crazed number. Okay, Trump people with suspicious connections to Russia, according to my cousin Jeremy. At Boston Jerry on Twitter. Um, <laughs> he actually has a big Twitter follow, even though he's just a regular guy. But, um, Flynn, Manafort, Cohen, Page, Stone, Sessions, Tillerson, Ross, Bannon, Gorka, Kushner, Ivanka. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of names. For somebody who says, I have nothing to do with Russia. Wow. Nothing whatsoever. While, again, the big picture here, the framing here that we can all be super confident in, it's not an allegation. 17 intelligence agencies say this is what happened. Russia intervened in our election to make Trump win. And it, let's be clear about that, in what way that means. Because some people, when they hear that, go, oh, are you saying they doctored the voting machines? Which, by, by the way, I believe that's possible, too. But what we are essentially talking about is more the, ironically, because you've heard this term from Trump, it's the fake news, the altering of news, creating these Facebook news stories that spread around everywhere. Is that what you think it that's mostly part, is? It's a few things. I mean, remember, in October, starting like the first week in October, every day, they started releasing thousands of emails that had been stolen from Hillary Clinton's campaign manager and from the DNC. And they released the, well, WikiLeaks released those every single day leading up to the election, creating a new flow of information every day that was this purloined information from the Democrats. Citing, and they're, they're trying to, with the DNC documents, they're trying to make the Bernie-Hillary split be so epic that no Democrat could ever get elected because there's two sides of the party and they don't trust mm -hmm. each other and they're fighting. And I mean, the, because of that, the Democratic Party chairwoman had to quit during the Democratic convention. Like right. that it's, that's all because of what Russia did, was hacking those documents and releasing them in the way they did to try to destroy the Democratic Party. That was literally Russian government, Russian military intelligence hackers. Okay. Okay. So that's one. Then there's the propaganda stuff that they do which is that they feed into all through bots and trolls and all sorts of paid sources. They feed into the U.S. media bloodstream 
news stories that aren't real, that are designed to exculpate uh, Trump when things look bad for Trump and to, in, to indict Clinton and make things look bad for Clinton. And it's one thing to do that like on a small scale, but when you do that on an industrial scale and you're talking tens of thousands of bots that are doing it, you can shift the media landscape. You can make all the truth seem muddy and you can say, make all the mud seem real. And that is what they did. And it's something that they've done in other countries. I mean, one of the things that we've learned since this happened is that if you look at Estonia, if you look at Finland, if you look at Sweden, actually in Finland they tried and the Finns kind of fought them off. But in all these other countries, they've done it. and The Russians the, have done this. The Russians have done it. And, you, you know, you said this thing about hacking the vote totals. The Russians interfered in an election that happened in the Netherlands, a Dutch election last year. They're about to have a presidential election in a week and a half. They're so freaked out about what Russians did to their last little election that they have changed their voting and are all voting by hand on paper for their presidential election. Because wow. the Russians have ha hacked them so hard and messed up their last referendum and got the outcome that they wanted in this referendum. They think it was a dress rehearsal to mess up their presidential vote counting, so they're all voting by hand. Okay, so let's let's go back to Rachel Maddow w popping up in the middle of the night in her plush Manhattan apartment, <laughs> grabbing water and thinking. Mineral water, yeah, of, course, of course, from my servants. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> from my servants. Now, do you, what is the deep down Manchurian candidate fear, the ultimate worst case scenario. Let's keep it like somewhat realistic, but, but like something that you think is possible, but you couldn't go on your show and say it because people would think you were nuts if you actually declared this is what it is. But because it's Hot 97, I can, get, exactly. I can get unreal. I mean, you can say whatever you want here. Yeah, no, this is just <laughs> this is just friends talking. And yeah. You're like, yo, you know what really freaks me out? <laughs> well, don't tell anybody that I said Okay, this. okay, totally, no. totally. I mean, the, the, the worst case scenario is that the Russian government is now controlling the U.S. presidency. That and that's bad. That would that would be not awesome. Okay, it would be like if you're like a Red Sox fan and it's Red Sox and Yankees in the World Series, and it turns hey, out Hal that Steinbrenner's the, running the Red Sox. Yeah, right. That it would turns not be out good. that like actually the Red Sox GM has some big debt or did something super mm. embarrassing, and the Yankees know about it, and they you know they're like it's all right, you stay there. You be in the World Series. You look like you're coaching, but we're actually going to line up your batting order. We're going to make your you know. We're gonna have you dose your batters. We're gonna, you know, whatever right, it's gonna right, be. Right, right, whatever it is. I, I mean, the worry is that Trump personally, or something in Trump world, has made him, has put him in a position where he has to do what Russia says, either because he owes them or because he's scared of them because they've got something on him. In which case, the U.S. government is being operated for the benefit of Vladimir Putin. And if that happens, if that has happened, there's a number of things that happen whether or not Trump ultimately you know, gets exposed and this turns out to be a real thing and he gets thrown out of office. I mean, for decades, US intelligence and Russian intelligence have been fighting each other, right? And like, we've got spies in the Russian government and presumably they've got spies in our government right, and stuff. Right, right. Have all those names already been given to Putin? Right. right. Like if we've got Russian people who are in Russian government and Russian military who are secretly working for us, who are giving us information, who are spies working for us. Have, have we already given Putin those guys' names? Because a lot of people named in that dossier, a lot of people who are randomly like part of intelligence units at the KGB, like people have been arrested, people have turned up dead, people like all sorts of people who might conceivably be American sources inside the Russian government have like fallen off buildings in the last couple of And we of don't months. know that those people are American informants or anything, but they no, could No, not at all. They might. They, I mean, that's the thing. We don't know anything about this. Well, and, but, and when will we ever know? How The thing, the other thing I worry about is how are we going to believe that this is ever truly investigated? They're in charge of the Justice Department now. I know. That's so, why that's Sessions so, recusing himself is a big deal. That's so crazy. So, okay. L let's... Let's let's look at what's happening in this very moment. Now we have the session situation. He recuses himself. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, do you believe that th that will be it? He'll be able to recuse himself. We'll move on. Sessions will just continue to move forward. I mean, obviously, we all know Sessions is a bad guy and has been a bad guy in a lot of ways for a very long time. He's a cartoonishly evil villain. I mean, as, <laughs> as I always put it to people, and it's very simple, I'm like, in the 80s, other Republicans said, you're too racist for this job. Yes. Republicans <laughs> in the 80s said yeah. that, okay? So that, that that's, that's an idea of who Sessions is. But is this is this <laughs> enough? Will this be the beginning of the end of Sessions or not? No. So the, the, the real deal with Russians and his criminal liability is that he lied under oath to Congress. 
So it, the Senate asked him when he was being confirmed, did you have contact with the Russians? Effectively, the, con the, the question was more complicated than that. But his answer was straight up, no, I right. had no contacts with the Russians. And now he... He did, he but did. it was just an ambassador, and I had, there were it two other matter. people there. Yeah, it and doesn't it, matter. And, right. I'm gonna, and I'm going to yeah. clarify my answer. Well, no, actually, when since he's been in the Senate, he's been the one, whenever anybody's like going for a judgeship or like a job that needs to be confirmed, he's the one who's like, if you perjure yourself, that's a felony. I will put you in jail. I mean, he's been this crusader on this stuff. He was like, there needs, Loretta Lynch needs to recuse herself. There needs to be a special prosecutor against Hillary Clinton. Like, he was, he has been a super hardliner on these issues, and now he's like... I didn't understand the question, and I was distracted thinking about next oh, week's thunderstorm. And did I say no? I meant yes. yes I get I, so confused. You were asking me about Russians. I thought you were asking me about Prussians. Russians? No, I've never heard <laughs> about Russians. <laughs> Russians? Oh, I see the Russians all the time. Of course I do. So it's so nuts. No, so, so the, the sessions thing. The sessions thing. A, there's the question of his perjury. And whether or not that would be investigated and prosecuted again, like what's going to happen there? Nobody thinks that he'll ever be held accountable for that, although lots of Democrats are calling for that. The other side is in terms of the Trump-Russia investigations, it used to be that when there was going to be a special prosecutor because the attorney general recused, a three-judge panel would come in, you know, lifetime appointments, non-political people would come in and they would name the special prosecutor. It doesn't work that way anymore. Now it's basically the attorney general or the deputy attorney general that picks the special prosecutor. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And Trump is nominating the deputy attorney general. Oh, right, perfect. Right, right now. Perfect. Right now. And uh, he will get approved? I think so. He's a lifetime prosecutor. I'm trying to do my due diligence on him and figure it out. But, like, anybody appointed by Trump gets to pick the prosecutor? Speaking of people appointed by Trump, let's switch gears a little bit so we can hit as much stuff as we can. Hmm. Did we luck out? Is Gorsuch not as bad as he could have been? Gorsuch is really, 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 really right wing. Okay. But that, so, by the way, these days, that's not necessarily the worst case scenario. <laughs> no. Oh, not a foreign agent. Yes, awesome. Yes. <laughs> not like, not legitimately evil, just really conservative. Not an anti civil rights hero for Doesn't decades. Doesn't hate America, like the principles of America. He <laughs> but that is literally a key thing to understand. When it comes to Trump's uh, people, a lot of them, my line for them is not how right wing they are, it's do they respect literally what the foundation of this country is? So, in, in the case of Gorsuch, is that the case? Is he someone who could be okay, just super right wing, which by the way is still scary for a lot of issues which are very important. I think he is a super right wing normal judge. Okay. But super right wing. Like like he de he's definitely like he's replacing Scalia. He's like in Scalia territory. Okay. But that said, you know, part of the th part of the knock on Gorsuch is that he's one of these people who seems like he decided he wanted to be on the Supreme Court when he was 7. And so since he's seven, he's never made a political comment ever. <laughs> you know, like right. He's one of these guys. He's always been. He's always been. And so in those cases, when and that's sort of the mode of justices that we get left and right, where you don't necessarily know what they're going to be like un until they get in there because they've never, ever spoken freely in their life in the hopes that they would someday get named, named to the court. Um, do you ever have any fear doing the work that you're doing right now? <clears throat> It doesn't work. The cough button doesn't work. No. No. I just coughed super loud because <laughs> wow. I was hitting the button. Wow. You really believe like, that sorry. cough button was going to work? I leaned oh, into the microphone and work. coughed. By the way, it's so nice that you thought Hot 97 would work yeah, in cough we, button. We have buttons that say cough that you're supposed to push. Next time you do it, point it. to me and I'll turn your mic off. Okay. That's the only way so I, can, I can do it. It's almost like it's a thing that makes other people cough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make Laura cough. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but really, because that's something I think about too. Like, do you, are you ever... I mean, you're in front scared. of the camera, so maybe you're, it's a little less scary for you because you're such a known face. But sometimes I worry about the maybe, there may be, I don't know what the number is. You'd probably know better than I do. But I'm guessing there's a group of maybe 20, 30, I don't know how many, main journalists. I'm talking about the Post, the Times, the, mm. place, the place that Trump knows if he goes down, the places that are eventually going to be responsible for taking him down. People that I consider right now, one day the movie, God willing, that will be made about these people is that they were the heroes who saved America. Yeah, it'll definitely be journalists. And it, yeah. it, it, it is journalists that have the chance to save America, which is why he's painting them as evil right now because he knows Absolutely. that they have stuff and they're getting close. Mm -hmm. So he has to paint them as more and more evil and it, you know, it's a smart play by him. So when they turn around, he's like, I told you, these were the ones that are evil. Right. Do you worry for them? Do you ever worry for yourself about being so outspoken about a group that is somewhat scary? You know, I worry in the abstract because of the way Putin operates with the press in Russia. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of dead investigative journalists in Russia. And, um, you know, there's this woman, Anna Polakovskaya, who's become like a real, I mean, a, a, a big enough hero that as me, as a non-Russian, knows her name and knows how to pronounce right, it. Right, right. And you struggle with pronunciations. And you really nailed I that do. one. So. <laughs> but like, 
<laughs> but Anna Polakovskaya, she was on a um, Aeroflot uh, Russian um, airline, like on a, on a commercial flight, and they poisoned her drink and almost killed her on the plane, and she survived. She fought back. She came back from the poisoning, and then they shot her in her apartment building. Like, they went back for her again. Damn. And she's one of, and the, the outlet that she writes for has had four, five, six of its journalists assassinated. So that's the way that Putin operates. I mean, Putin is 17 years in power, right? And he's got to be running again. Like, you know, part of the reason that Russia is able to be super strategic and think for the long term and work on these things that don't pay off for a decade is because they know they're going to have the same freaking dictator in power 10 years later when it needs to pay off. Yeah, he can afford to think big because he's got basically got rid, he's made illegal his political opposition and killed the independent press. That is a very exciting prospect for somebody who's like autocratically minded. And so anybody who's looking at Putin as a model, when I look at the way Putin has treated, the, I mean, killed journalists, I do worry about it. In terms of day-to-day -day life, I mean, I think all of us who are sort of in the, in the public political world, I think we all take precautions. But you can't really let it affect how ambitious you get in your work. It's crazy because, I mean, we're, we work for a hip-hop station and we constantly talk about it. I mean, Ebro opens up the mic with, oh, by the way, Fuck Donald Trump. You know, I mean, he doesn't say it, but he says F it. And, and we, right. you know, we're really open about how we feel in, in, in our uh, opinions. And I've definitely been, you know, approached in the street and harassed mm -hmm. on social media and blah, blah. And I could imagine we're tiny compared to someone like you. Well, but does it make you feel like you shouldn't say those things? That you should avoid political topics no. on your no. show? No. no. I mean, that's no. the thing. It's like, it's good to know. It's good to be cognizant about it. Good to be smart about it. Right. It's good to get help, especially if you feel like something is particularly off or something feels different than it used to, or feels like something you can't handle it, but it doesn't, you can't let it affect your work, or you won't make it into the movie. Very good point. <laughs> and I at least want to have a bit part. There was this one hip-hop station, actually, that was really aggressive. <laughs> um, who's the strangest bedfellow you found recently? Because like, we always talk about this, like, I'll never get over it. To me, the funniest thing, and I really try to take some joy in this time that's so terrible. I try mm -hmm. to take joy in the little moments. Like, I take joy in hearing an interview with George W. Bush and being like, I love that guy. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I, I mean, yeah, he fought an unjust war and thousands of people died, but that's what regular presidents do. Yeah, uh, when I said you know, it, remember when I sent you the clip, I was like, why does it sound that bad? Yeah, it's like, he's so wacky. He's talking about his daughters, his normal, relative normal, <laughs> regular American crazy rich we're used to. Like, are there, do you have moments also, like that? Also, his scandals were adorable. Oh relative to this, it's like, what? <laughs> exactly. Remember the U.S. attorney scandal where he was replacing the prosecutors with loyal Bushies? God, that was adorable. Yeah. There were no Russians in that at all. Yeah, it was just people <laughs> doing political favors like they always do. Remember, did you hear? Okay, remember when I sent you the clip and he was talking about uh, the press, right? He's like, we need press. We need people to hold us accountable because, you know, power can go to your head real easily. I'm yes. like, wow. Well, the funniest that's thing, coming out of him? I, I have found very, <laughs> what's very interesting about Bush, besides the fact that, yes, th those memes were amazing when Trump got elected where it's like, when your ex-girlfriend, your crazy ex-girlfriend starts looking really good, yeah. <laughs> and I love that. But also, he actually is much more comfortable not being president. Yeah. And when you hear interviews with him, I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going crazy and starting to say he's a, a genius, but he is smarter than I certainly ever felt he was as president because he seems more confident now when he talks. Yeah, and when, he's been through it. I mean, whatever, I mean, he did a lot of bad things, and I think he was a terrible president. But he did make it through eight years as president, saw everything that you see, and I think he's matured, and I think he is more comfortable. And he does have stuff to say about what it means to be a normal conservative, which is worth remembering for if you're a Republican right now. You know, there's another option than going with this guy who believes that, you know, NATO ought to be abolished and... You know, that Vladimir Putin ought to be a role model and that the press is the enemy of the state. You know, there's another option. You can still be a conservative and not be that anti-American. Is it worse? How much worse is it than you thought it would be if he won? Or is it not worse? I think that the thing I am I'm, I'm a little surprised by, but I don't know if it's better or worse, is that they're so um, chaotic and out of control. Like, they really haven't been... I, I sort of... When I thought about the prospect of them winning and I thought about Bannon being in there as the senior counselor and all this stuff, Ugh. I sort of thought they'd be kind of rolling stuff out, kind of Death Star style, you know, like boom, boom, boom. But organized at least. Organized, and they would know what they were going to do. And they tried to make it appear that that's how they were, with all those executive orders that they lined up. And then we all started reading the executive orders and we're like, wait a minute, this is like, this is like a bubblegum wrapper. Like, this does nothing. Like, this whole thing about, you know, we put the executive order in to start building the wall. What that actually was 
they told the Department of Homeland Security, see if you guys have any extra cash around <laughs> that you're not using. Right and if now, we find yeah. any extra cash, remember, <laughs> Mexico is going to pay for the wall. No. Meanwhile, you have the Mexican president basically saying, fuck you. Exactly. We're not paying for shit. We're not, we are not doing that. So that whole thing, build the wall, was see if you can find some money. So the wall is estimated to cost like $20 billion. Which, by the way, just for the record, in terms of buying walls, it's not bad. I think <laughs> it's a decent price for a big wall. It's Let's actually be a beautiful wall. I mean, it's a gorgeous they, wall. They say that the money that they found to do it, which is how they're going to build the wall, is $20 yeah, million. $20 million. Dollars. 20 million instead of $20 billion. So one, one <laughs> thousand. Is that a thousand? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like, that's it. That's all they have planned. And the guy who's the head of the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee that gives you money for stuff in Congress, has already said, I've not given him any money for that wall. So Mexico's not paying for the wall. Congress is not paying for the wall. They have found one one-thousandth of the money they need for the wall, and that's the whole plan for the wall. It's so ridiculous. So that chaos and incoherence and, like, laugh-out-loud idiocy, I didn't expect. Is that good in a president? Is it Maybe that's good in an evil president? Like, oh, you're evil, but you are bad at being evil. That's better at being good at being are evil. You any, are, are you any less scared and frantic than you were the first few weeks? Because I felt the first few weeks were frantic to the point of like, he's literally gonna start a war tomorrow. Mm. Do, do, and I still, don't get me wrong, I'm still in, obscenely concerned, but I, I feel a little less frantic only because I've seen, and I told a lot of my frantic family members and friends, have a little bit of faith in this system that has been created and that we, we do, as messed up as America is in a lot of ways, we do have a checks and balances system that should work and effectively not allow him to do. He's going to get some stuff done that's bad, mm -hmm. like the, the north, the, the 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 pipeline. That stuff's bad. He's able to actually. Well, the impact deportation that. stuff is freaking terrible. Yeah, and, I, I want you to to break down where we stand right now with the travel ban. Okay, the travel ban. Well, the two things: the deportation thing and the travel ban. Yeah. And, let, let me actually, can I, you mind if I talk about the deportation thing for no, a second? Please, 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 yeah. So there was this guy named Tom Ricks, who's a defense expert, who wrote really good books on the Iraq war. He just wrote a piece in the New York Times this past weekend that I felt like was one of those things where it's like you kind of see shooting stars. You're like, oh, that makes sense. He was like, remember what happened at Abu Ghraib? Like, George W. Bush started this, you know, torture prisoners, torture terrorists, torture suspects pro problem. Uh, program and he they set up Abu Ghraib and remember they said we're going to take the gloves off we're going to take the shackles off and let our people do what they need to do and we ended up with this freaking torture regimen and it was a nightmare and it took a decade to unravel it and there's you know it's just it was been horrible a horrible thing what they're doing right now with the deportations is saying that exact same thing to border patrol they're saying to ICE and to say to border patrol we're to take the gloves off take the shackles off do whatever you want follow your instincts deport whoever you feel like and they want to build, they want to hire 10,000 more people, so that'll be brand new people on the job. And they want detention facilities for tens, if not hundreds, thousands more people. And But the way they're doing it is not by being like an orderly system. They're just literally telling Border Patrol, do whatever you want, go for it. Yeah, so it's not a policy, it's, it's a phone call. The, poli it's a the policy is like, go for it. That's the policy. Right, just people telling people. And when you have a policy like that, when it is like, just cut loose, whatever you felt like restrained you in your job before, doesn't restrain you anymore, follow your nose. That's when you get really abusive, evil stuff really fast. Yeah, and that, when, and you, that, when you hear of them jumping into a house and plucking a mother at 5 a.m. from her children. And pulling a woman a with a brain tumor out of a hospital where she is for Yo, treatment. Well, now, we, now, when we heard about that, remember the, the, the hospital stuff? It was giving me nightmares. Well, so, it's so, a nightmare. So, it is a nightmare. And, and real quick, and that's a situation where checks and balances can't help because, like you said, this isn't policy. This is just word of mouth almost. This, like, this is, is the what administration. We're doing. Yeah, this is the administration saying two things. And their executive order, they're saying, do whatever you want. Your, your priority now is to pick up whoever you feel like it. You feel free. And then the public statements is criminals are violent and uh, 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 criminals are violent, terrible cr are people who, are, who are, are raping and killing Americans, right? They're, they've set up an office of immigrant crime, right? They've set up an office in Homeland Security to highlight for Americans crimes committed by immigrants. So there's this public campaign to make immigrants into demons and, and, and violent threats to America. And the policy side of it is, go. you guys go do what you can want. Can anything be done to, to work against this? Well, Is Congress, the, can they do anything? Public pressure would matter. Um, Congress can make a stink about it, but they've got a lot of, I mean, this actually, this, I mean, anybody who's in, in an immigrant community, right, which is all of New York listening to this, much. you've known forever that this is kind of a lawless area. It's really hard to get a lawyer. It's really hard to get due process, really hard to get out if you get locked up, really hard to get back into the country if you've been sent out of the country, even yes. if they sent you out of the country wrong. It's always been an area yeah. in our policy where people are mistreated. But and now it's just on steroids. So how does that work in sanctuary cities? 
Well, they're they're saying that we're gonna, you know, punish sanctuary cities and undo them and everything. It's interesting. The Catholic Church just a couple days ago put out an or it's so interesting to see the politics of the Catholic Church. They put out a, a directive to priests and to Catholic school principals saying, we want to remind you that you do not let anybody into your property. That means your church, your Catholic school, your Catholic university without a warrant. And so if ICE shows up, Border Patrol shows up, and they say they want to come in and take people who you've given giving sanctuary to, only with a warrant do you let them in, Mr. Priest. Right? So that, like, they're setting up for a real moral confrontation. Wow, which is incredible because ultimately as people who we, uh, seem to not understand in this country, it's one of the things that has baffled me about the Republican Party in general, is that at the heart of Christianity and Catholicism is the exact opposite of what all this is. Yeah. It's about, and, and frankly, you can have a problem with the America's connection to religion, but ultimately a lot of the good morals of what America has come from Christian principles like that. Yeah. that and, and like churches to having a role like that, or synagogues or mosques having a role like that. So you're right, it'll it, it's gonna create an incredible conundrum because Trump's gonna, they're gonna be saying like, no, no, we're gonna demand we go into churches. And you're mm -hmm. gonna have, you're gonna be, you know, pushing priests out of the way, old priests out yeah, of the way, right. so you can drag people out. It's it's an unbelievable scenario. And it's, you know, and on the on the travel ban, on the Muslim ban, the, the groups who you saw stand up and say, are you kidding? You're telling refugees who have been cleared to come into this country because they are fleeing persecution with their families, with their grandparents, and with their infants. You're telling them, no, you can't come in because we've decided you're a threat based on where you're from. The groups that stood up for that were, yeah, lawyers and, you know, people who are anti-Trump protesters, but also Jews from all over the country, Jewish people people were like, wait a minute, you turned us away as refugees from the Nazis. Literally, the U.S. government may have thinks, you know, we think we did a great job in World War II and our military did, but it took us a long time to get there. And in the meantime, there were boats full of Jewish refugees fleeing the Nazis that got turned away at U.S. ports and sent back and those people died. And it's, no, we're not going to do that again. You know, we're just not going to do that again. And so you've got religious traditions or, you know, where it doesn't matter if you're liberal or conservative. You've got religious traditions that are deep in this country that are on a head-on collision course with the way they're treating the people who have the least rights and are the most vulnerable. Yet somehow yeah. many, many religious people were convinced, and for whatever reason, to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. For a man whose ideals don't appear to have anything to do with that. A man who, by all accounts, wasn't actually religious at any point. I mean, listen, every practically every president is full of it when it comes to how religious they are. Right. Even the presidents I've liked yeah, the George most. George W. Bush was supposedly super pious. He did not go to church as president. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> so, like, and, and I rarely buy it with any of them, but in this case, it's it's the most unbelievable. Um, um I wanted to talk to you also about Flint. Yeah. Because that sometimes I feel like we try to bring it up as much as we can on our show. But you know how it was like a a, a, a trending topic, a thing at one point, and all of a sudden people don't seem to go back and realize that the water is still polluted in Flint right now. That's right. And what is happening? The thing that just happened right now in Flint, well, there's two things. The thing that just happened just a couple days ago is that they started telling people of Flint that they've got to start um, paying for their city water again, yeah, what the which hell? they still can't drink. But now, one of the, I mean, one of the baseline things about this, the way this problem started is that Flint had the highest water bills in the country. There was no more expensive water. Just when your water bill comes every month, nobody in the country was paying more for their water than Flint was. And while the, while the water was being poisoned. And so now they want people to start paying for it again, even though they still haven't cleaned it up. So that's the one thing. The other thing that's going on is that, um, so all, you know, the, the lead poisoning concern for everybody who is exposed, particularly kids for exposed, there's, yeah. no, there's no antidote to yes. lead poisoning. The other concern is that there's something called Legionnaire's disease, yeah. mm -hmm. which is uh, so, sort of looks like flu, but it, it's not the flu and it can kill you. And there was a spike in Legionnaire's disease around the time this happened, and they thought that it might have resulted in somewhere like between 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 deaths. We're now starting to get data that is starting to make it look like the Legionnaire's part of this, which is correlated with this same poisoning, which all happened around the same time, and we think it is probably the same thing, uh, meaning the same uh, a product of the same action by the mm -hmm. state government. We think that it might be a lot more people dead. And because, and the reason that these numbers are now emerging is because they were originally put down as deaths to uh, um, attributed to flu, but Legionnaire's disease looks like flu, mm -hmm. but and now we're starting this. to realize that it was Legionnaire's disease. And if it was Legionnaire's disease, it likely was caused by the state. And by the way, there are other places, including right here in like New Jersey, in, in Jersey, where there are water problems that are very similar to Flint. Yeah, the difference with Flint is that it was their their water was fine, and they and did they, it. and they did it. 
Yeah. They did. They rushed this stupid policy change that was all about saving money. Uh, we think it was about saving money and not a corruption thing, but who knows? We'll get to the bottom of it someday. They made a decision that turned their perfectly good water into poison, and it was a, and it wasn't a locally made decision. It was made by the state. They took they took away Flint's local democracy. The state said, "No, no, no. You're poor. Your budget is out of whack. We we no longer recognize your elected officials. We're going to make your decisions for you." And then it was the state that came in and made this decision to poison that water. So the fact that the state still hasn't fixed it. Yeah, and, and just a reminder to people, and I say this just for the sake of us understanding what things are like generally, and this is a problem that happened, obviously, under President Obama. Mm -hmm. This is something that people, there are a lot of stories like this that we have enough things to deal with just because of the Trump administration, but it's important that we recognize that a lot of these problems, yeah. these are just problems of the poor in America yes. and have been, regardless well, of administration. In Michigan, I mean, respectfully, though, in Michigan, this was a problem because Michigan has this radical law which is called the emergency management You, you told us about this last time. It's yeah. insane. They come in and they say, you know what? Poor community, mostly black communities in Michigan, we we believe the government declares you can no longer have local democracy. We don't care who you vote for locally. Your little city council, your mayor, that's cute. You can, they, can have, they can stay there in office, but we're taking away their decision-making power. The governor is taking over. It's, emergent, it's like governing as a business. That's where this comes from. And they have somebody come in as a dictator with no responsibility to local people. Nobody votes for them. Nobody can vote them out. And they make these decisions. And you know what? That's how you get a decision like this in, in Michigan. And that's why it's, it's, not like a, it's not like other lead poisoning around the country, actually. It's not like other places that have bad infrastructure or pipes that need replacing. But how could that be stuff. allowed? To, how could that happen? How can the feds not step in and be like, this is not something that can happen in a state? There's What's interesting is that in Michigan, the people of Michigan, there was a referendum on this on the ballot. Do you want to keep this emergency manager law? People voted, no, let's get rid of it. And the Republicans in the state legislature came in right after that vote, and they rewrote it. They recreated the emergency management law. They put in a new one that was even stronger that couldn't be repealed by referendum. Uh, so like, you just can't is, win. This is like, I know it sounds partisan for me to say it, but like this is a Republican governance problem. Like this wasn't like any other infrastructure issue or like poor community issue anywhere in the country. This was like radicalism, anti-democratic so radicalism. Specific crazed Michigan Republicans are basically responsible for yeah, it. Yeah, and there are the other Republicans around the country have kicked around these emergency management ideas, and it's just... Because, like, wow, this is, a, this is a great way to poison black people. Yeah. We can do this <laughs> other places. It's working Go great ahead. there. Um, oh, oh, you, so this week, uh, President Trump gives his, uh, his, his speech um, to Congress, and... We got on the air that morning, and Ebro and I, we didn't, neither of us had really seen it, but we both saw each, the, each other in the morning. We said, we, we read enough, and I listened to five minutes of it. And I did what all people do these days, I think, if you don't have time, and it's not your job to watch every word. I was out that night. I would have watched if I was home, but I wasn't. So I came home, checked the headlines, and said, let's see how bad, how awful this was. And when I read the Post, Washington Post, that is, and Times, I went, oh. Well, he obviously buttoned it up tonight yep. and uh, and did a fine job. Did it, did what he had to do. So I get the I get to work in the morning and I basically say, listen, my approach today is going to be, I don't believe anything that he promised, of course, and he said some things that were just outright outrageous, like they always are. But as far as Donald Trump goes, he was as buttoned up and presidential as he's, as he's capable of being. So I don't feel the need. I'm not going to sit here and try to make it sound like it was horrible last night because it wasn't. Right. And frankly, I find it ineffective to the other arguments I make the, the other 90 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. If I act as if it was the worst speech ever when it was it was fine. Right. It was what you'd expect from a Republican president. I mean, obviously, if you gave me 10 minutes in that prompter, I could have delivered the same speech. But whatever. And then I get a couple of texts from people and they're like, did you see Van Jones? Hmm. And I'm like. No, but from my lunatic friends who I got them from, I figured maybe he said the same thing I did, and they're just angry about it. And I was like, oh, maybe I'd agree with him. Then I watched his clip, and I thought, well, wow. Van Jones really went above and beyond here. I yeah. mean, he's saying it was the night he became president. It was one of the greatest, most <laughs> interesting political moments I've ever seen, referring <laughs> to him talking to the widow of yeah. uh, the Navy SEAL, which, mm -hmm. by the way, I mean, it was it was a nice moment that I— that, it's poor, not, that poor woman. It's, yeah. uh, it's not unlike things we've seen happen in many other speeches similar with mm. other presidents. Yeah. And frankly, um, the only time he went off the script, he said something completely inappropriate, which was overlooked, when he said, if your husband's looking down right now, he's proud he just broke a record. No, Mr. President, American heroes don't die so they can look down from heaven and get credit for the standing ovation they asked for. That's not why they do those things. Right. It's because they're heroes. They're, you're the one who wants ovations, not them. In fact, I could tell he loved getting the ovation. It was almost as if he was getting the ovation. Right. Yeah. And not you. Yeah. So that said, 
what was Van Jones thinking going that over the top? <laughs> I don't want to create intermediate beef, but yes, I do. But what was he thinking? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, commenting on a speech in real time is hard. And I don't know Van, and I didn't see it. We were doing our own coverage. But, like, it's... You know, what happens usually, and they've actually made it a little harder in this administration, what happens usually is that, you know, they finished the speech and you get it a few minutes before the president delivers it. And so you can read it for its content. And then once you've read it, knowing what the like policy stuff is and what the controversial things are going to be, then you listen for it to see how it's received, to see if there's any interesting outlives, see if there's any interesting response. And by the end of it, you sort of cooked up something good to say. In this case, we didn't get anything oh they didn't send you anything no we didn't get anything at all Shocking. so we're all experiencing it live in the moment um and what was your n natural live reaction to it it's funny that you say that he was buttoned up you used that phrase a couple times he he literally was buttoned up this was one of the weird things during the inauguration he's never buttoned his coat very good point he was wearing a totally different suit remember and a the, totally the tie, i said a better tie, tie. normal yeah. length yeah. With yeah. A norm, yeah. without the huge yeah. wide yeah. Uh, yeah. 1983 a uh, wall street uh, <laughs> tie and i mean the movie wall street like that's what he normally does he actually had a respect a semi-respectful yeah. tie and you're right he actually and was he buttoned buttoned up. his jacket he never buttons his jacket that's part of his thing is he got this tie that goes down to his knees <laughs> and he keeps his jacket open and it's like he looks like a flag from a distance but in this case he was dressed like a normal president and he gave sort of a normal sounding speech and I think it was well received relative just because of seems, course people are expecting him to bite the head off a bat and he doesn't bite the head off a bat and he gives a speech that a president might give and although it has some crazy Trump policy in it it's like the most moderate sounding version of Trump okay good it's just not that newsworthy a speech because of it it's like oh look something terrible didn't happen yes something terrible shocking and new didn't happen and then the next day his attorney general admits oh yeah i did meet with russians <laughs> i know that and by the way that Bam. was exactly why i said let's not jump all over the speech just hang out for 24 hours you'll have something real to jump all over exactly and that's yeah. what we get that's now um do you think the media is and obviously you're part of that media and you did a report like this week which i want to ask you about which was amazing about the connections between trump and russia mm -hmm. um but is the media specifically in the era post the dossier where it seemed like we have a smoking gun? And obviously the whole media knew about this dossier. Mm -hmm. And it was eventually one specific website that decides we're going to just go with it. I believed at the time, based on nothing except my own brute intelligence, <laughs> that a lot of the stuff in the dossier was probably true. But it wasn't substantiated. Mm -hmm. So as a result, this huge thing which we had in the holster was kind of wasted. It just kind of flew out there and went away for a while. And I thought, well, that stinks because now if real stuff comes back from it, which is happening, mm -hmm. people aren't going to care as much. And they don't. Right. So I think in the era after that time, it seems as if the media, instead of trying to throw the big haymaker every time, is just one step at a time being like, here's this. It's totally backed up on every level. Is that what you think the media is doing right now? There, it's funny. Like NBC had a story this week that was about, um, and one of, the, one of the really serious parts about the, uh, the sort of State of the Union speech was the discussion about that Yemen raid, right? So there's this incredibly emotional moment with the widow of the Navy SEAL who was killed in that raid, and Trump makes this inappropriate comment about how happy he'd be about his ovation, blah, blah, blah. The, 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 the deep and super ugly part of that, whether or not you have any strong feelings about the human nature of what he did to that widow, um, is that the same day Trump was asked about that Yemen raid and was like basically like, yeah, that was an Obama thing. Like, oh, the one where the Navy SEAL died and four other Navy SEALs were injured and we had to blow up a $75 million plane and lots of kids and women from Yemen were all killed. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. That was the generals. It wasn't me. I didn't, I, I'm not responsible for that. Okay. And then he's trying to say, and he says in his speech, and by the way, it was a hugely successful raid. We Everyone's tons... saying it's successful. Mattis just told me how successful yes, I, it was. And then he quotes Jim Mattis and says it's super successful. So NBC had this story this week that was, you know what, that Yemen raid, it was obviously a human tragedy on lots of different levels. It also produced no significant intelligence. So whatever it was for, they did not get it. It was a, it was a, it was a human failure and it was a tragedy, but it was also a mission failure. They did not get anything. And so NBC floated that story. And then NBC re-ran that story, just say, like basically reiterate, reiterating it. And the second time they ran it, basically all they did was insert in the middle of it, oh, and by the way, we've got 10 separate sources on this. 10. New York Times, uh, Washington Post wrote a piece a week and a half ago where they had, you know, one of, the, one of the pieces in the puzzle. They had one of these new revelations. And they put like halfway during the story, by the way, we have nine separate sources on this. 
Yeah, so people are nailing stuff down like you can't believe because Trump is attacking the media because any little crack in any story they yeah. use to say that it's fake news. But pe I've never in my life in this world, in, in, in news and in politics, I have never seen a story that cites nine sources or ten sources. And that's becoming like Usually a Usually if thing. you have if you have a one or two very reliable sources, that's yeah. enough yeah. to go with. For right? me, yeah. for my show, two sources is reportable. One source is mentionable with the caveat that it's one source if it's something really important. And but like two sources, like go with it. Ten? Like <laughs> Yeah, ten is just called a fact. Yes, that's... exactly. And so you're you are seeing that now. Uh, the story you did Monday night, uh, my buddy Robin Lumberg sent it to me the other day, and it's like a, it was a 21-minute piece about uh, his... It, it was sort of drawing some of the lines between Trump's money and Russia mm -hmm. and his property in Florida, which... Is there a way to summarize it? Because you, you, you were great, by the way, how you set it up. You were basically just like, these stories shouldn't be this long. I know it's kind of hard to hold someone's attention, but do me a favor. Yeah. Give me 20 minutes, because yeah. <laughs> I need you to follow along, because it was a step-by-step, -step, like, there's this guy, there's this guy. And, and ultimately, with the, all of this stuff, they knew that it would be hard to catch them on a lot of stuff because it is complicated. Right. And, it, and I, by the way, the brilliance of the people working for you and the reporters everywhere to figure out how to tie these things together, yeah. because it really is, uh, when you get to it, it's pretty blatant uh, connections, yeah. but finding them still seems challenging. Yeah. Can you explain the story somewhat? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can. Hopefully it won't be 20 minutes, right? <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the point of doing a story like this is that we're trying to figure out the big question, which is like, why are all these people talking to Russia? Like, why does why is Russia involved in our campaign? Right. Why is like wh wh why why are these people talking to Russia? Why are they all lying about it? Like, what 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 could explain this? And I am more and more of the belief that the thing that explains it is not some secret thing that nobody's turned up yet and that we're going to find like you know in some encrypted place that nobody's looked before. I sort of feel like some of the stuff is hiding in plain sight. One of the things hiding in plain sight is the largest, most expensive home purchase ever in U.S. history. $95 million paid for a house. And it happened in Palm Beach. It was at a time when Donald Trump was really broke. Uh, and he owed $40 million to Deutsche Bank, and Deutsche Bank like wanted the money, and he was like, I, it's a bit, sorry, it's not going to happen. Um, and at that time, there was a big-ass house in Palm Beach that was really, really ugly. Um, and it was on the water. It was like not far from Mar-a-Lago. And it, the guy who owned it went bankrupt. Trump bought it at bankruptcy option for $40 million. And he turned around, and two years later, he sold it for $95 million. Wait a minute. You only bought it for 40 What's going Like, nothing changed. Florida hasn't gotten that great. Right. No. I love Florida. It hasn't gotten that great. At right. that point, housing prices in Florida in general went down by 5%. Got it. Over the and same period. He Over the same period of time. But in two years, he goes from $40 million to almost $100 million? What happened there? And the house was a nightmare. It was full of mold. Like, it was really ugly. The guy who bought it never moved into it, may never have stepped foot in it, and tore it down. So... Basically, this was a way for somebody to pay Donald Trump $55 million. Yeah. <laughs> this is what he did. And it turns out that the guy who bought it is a Russian. He's, they call him the king of fertilizer because he cornered the market on potash or something. I don't know. He's a zillionaire. And at the time, there's two things to know about him. Number one, he's going through a divorce. Going through a divorce in Russia, that is the most expensive divorce in modern history. Yes. At one point, his <laughs> wife gets awarded $4.5 billion. As yeah, and you said it went settlement. through, like, how many different Six courts? Six different courts in all these different countries and stuff. A Swiss court or offers her, gives her, as orders the settlement of $4.5 billion. And so part of the thing that, part of the way that she says he reacted to this divorce proceeding. Coming up with $4.5 billion in divorce, by the way, can you imagine your friends, like her Russian friends, be like, yes, girl, you got $4.5 billion, boo. <laughs> So what That's a good day. He, that he's basically <laughs> trying to get rid of all his money, to lock up all his money yeah. in overseas trust and stuff so she can't bank. get assets, right, right? Right. And so he buys a $150 million Greek island, the island where Jackie O and Aristotle Analysis got married. And he buys this, uh, he, he buys an 80, he buys the most expensive apartment in New York City for his daughter. For his daughter, yes. $88 million apartment in Central Park. So he bu he's buying all of this stuff everywhere and including that he buys spends a hundred million dollars 95 million dollars on this donald trump house but he's 
trying to move as much of his money off his balance sheet as possible. He's not trying to get a good price. Yeah, he's just he's out. In fact, the opposite. Yeah, yeah, he's looking yeah, yeah. for a bad he's price so he can spend price. the money. Exactly. Right, right, right. So that's one thing to know about him. This is the last piece. The other thing to know about him is that he is one of the largest sh shareholders in this shady bank that's in Cyprus, where lots of Russian oligarchs hold their money. And one of the vice chairmen of that uh, bank is a Putin guy who's very close to Putin. One of, the, one of the largest shareholders is this guy who gave Trump all the money. The chairman of the bank is the chairman of Deutsche Bank, who Trump owes all that money to. Remember, he doesn't want to pay his $40 million. Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank at this point, got, for this time in history, got a, 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 got a fine of over $600 million from the Justice Department for laundering Russian oligarchs' money. Right, so even though Russia saw the same thing and only fined them five thousand. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Russia was like, "Oh, you're laundering Putin's relatives' money. We charge you five thousand dollars <laughs> and demand you pay." <laughs> That's great. That's so great. the the last piece of it is that the there's one American involved in that bank with that triangle of people: the Putin guy, the Deutsche Bank guy, and the fertilizer guy who's given all this money to Donald Trump. There's one other person in that bank, the vice chairman of that bank, the single largest shareholder in that bank, was just confirmed as Commerce Secretary on Monday. Wilbur Ross, Trump's longtime friend. So the implication of that, you can connect all those dots however you want. The implication of that story is that, you know what the Russian, you know why Trump owes Russia? You know why Trump is so deferential to Russia? You know why he's doing whatever they say? Because they have given him tens of millions of dollars whenever he needed it, particularly when he was at risk of going bankrupt. And it was all organized by his friends, who he's now brought into the administration, and Putin was in on it, and all of his oligarch friends were in on it. But they gave him, it's, it's money. They gave him money when he needed money. And now he's like, but anybody who gives me money, I owe you. But let's also remember, if you look at that from a slightly more gangster per perspective, anyone who owes you, who, who's given you that kind of money, there's other there's other things there. Of yeah. course. And, and what, you, what they have on you. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why you don't want to owe a book. A bookie will spot you money. If you want to keep betting, that bookie will hold you down and let you keep betting. Yeah. But there's ultimately a price to pay. Mm -hmm. Putin isn't the kind of guy, and none of these guys are the kind of guys who are throwing you $55 million because they're generous. Right. There's other things involved there. And it's, you know what they want? They don't necessarily want that money back. What they want is they want to own you, control mm. you, direct you for the rest of your you, career. Uh, yeah, like you just bought a really powerful billionaire who if you handle him correctly and put the right people around him and spend the right money, he might just be able to become president of the United States. And one of the weird things about Russia and Trump, which was my other segment that night, is that there's a lot of people who ended up in Trump's orbit, including this guy Paul Manafort who ended up running his campaign for a long time, who make no sense as a choice for an American politician. Like, why would you pick Paul Manafort? Like... Paul Man like, who, we pick him out of a phone book. He's basically known for, like, a lobbyist who represents dictators abroad. Mm -hmm. But from a Russian perspective, they love Paul Manafort. He's been super involved in their politics. He's run all sorts of shenanigans for them in terms of pro-Putin politicians in other countries and everything. He's a huge deal to them. So did they pick Paul Manafort for Trump? There's this Carter Page guy who's like, <laughs> Trump was like, didn't have any foreign policy people in his campaign. And they went to, Washington Post was like, you have to have foreign policy advisors. Who are your foreign policy advisors? And Trump was like, uh, Carter Page. Nobody in America has ever heard of Carter Page. Turns out he lives in Moscow. He's an American guy, lives in Moscow, is involved in all of this Russian oil and gas, Putin stuff or whatever. And he says, yeah, that's my foreign policy advisor. Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, CEO of Exxon. Trump and Rex Tillerson had never met each other before the election. But Tillerson, the American who is closest personal friends with Vladimir Putin, who has received an Order of Friendship Medal, the highest civilian award they give to non-Russians in Russia. Putin pinned it on him himself. Trump had never met Rex Tillerson before the election. And then he ends up Secretary of State. Who decided he was going to be Secretary of State? From the Russian perspective, Rex Tillerson is their best friend. I mean, that's that's so... Secretary of State of all positions. Yeah. To be best friends with... Wow. I mean, I've watched enough House of Cards to just know that's not okay. I know. So you just made my stomach hurt. Yeah, I'm there's sorry. A, there's a lot. <laughs> so you're, you're, again, not calming us down whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> last thing, I'll let you get out of here. Um, the DNC gets together the other day. A lot of people were excited about Ellison. Mm -hmm. Ends up being Perez, not Ellison. Well, How, Perez and Ellison, right? Or, yes, yes, yeah, number guess, two, right. Exactly. Yep. Ended up bringing him right in, which was it was almost like a wrestling move, which I sort of appreciate, being like, I might be your guy. But I'm bringing, you might have went with Hulk Hogan, but guess what? Hulk Hogan's bringing in the macho man with him. <laughs> um, how did? Or if Hillary had picked Bernie to be a running mate. Well, don't get you me know? started. Okay. That, it would have made too much sense in retrospect for Hillary to have brought. No, let's bring in the most generic, totally nice, 
<laughs> the most generic white bread politician right. who cannot even bring you his own like nothing comes with that. But anyways, uh, how do you feel about that? Was it was it weak? Should they have just gone Ellison all out when they were scared to go that way? How, how the do you feel about it? The fact that Ellison said, you know what, I'd be happy to be deputy chair, let's work together. I tried to book Tom Perez on the night of the State of the Union to talk to him, and he was like, he was like, I won't be on your air without Keith, El Keith Ellison. We're we're do we do everything together now. The fact that they've reacted to it the way they have, that they there isn't some like bitter split between them or whatever, they've put it aside, they're like, we're all pulling the same direction. I feel like okay. Well, I b I believe them. I don't think that I don't think they're faking. Is there a re but is there a reason why Ellison is better in that spot? Like, is there a chance? No, it's just. I mean, if you if you're interested in what Ellison brings to the table, you should be happy that he's still at the table. And yes. it seems like it's a substantive job and real substantive work that he's doing. I actually don't think that Perez and Ellison are that different in terms of their politics, in terms of where they're coming from. Yeah, they've got different backgrounds, but in terms of what they want to do with the Democratic Party, it's not that different. And it's and the differences between them are not incompatible. Like they can find compromise and pull in the same way. So I think if you really liked Ellison, if you really thought that Keith Ellison was going to be the man, you should be happy that he's deputy chair of the DNC. Um, and you know, hold him to it. You know, if Perez starts doing stuff that you feel like is too mainstream or uh, you know corporate or whatever it is that you're worried about with Tom Perez, I don't expect that from him. But hold him to it. I mean, the Democratic Party has to listen to their people now because they got nothing else. Did you, uh, did you peep when they tweeted out, when Perez tweeted Donald Trump after they congratulated him, when he was like, we're going to be a worst nightmare? <laughs> did, you, did you see that tweet? Yeah, no. yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, like, I like that. I like that. Me too. Yeah. That's the, I, I, I appreciate it. Who's the, who's the uh, last one? Who's the, who's the Republican who has made you throw up in your mouth the most? And by that I mean <laughs> of all the people that go, well, if Paul Ryan does this, and if this one will just, and all of them just fold. And no one ever steps up. I mean, with, with the exception of, um, you know, McCain, like who you kind of got to expect it from. Again, the strange bedfellows, like people who, you know, he's been pretty regularly sticking it to Trump when he can. Yeah, here's the thing, though, about McCain. Well, you give me the, give me the side that I'm missing, because I end up kind of falling for it. The McCain thing, what McCain and 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 Lindsey Graham is good about this. Marco Rubio can sometimes be a little good about this. Is they're really good at getting headlines and getting press coverage that makes it appear that they are being courageous. And then when it comes down to actually doing something, just pulling hope. the trigger to do something that will change the course of what's about to happen, they never do. None that. of them have. So Marco Rubio comes out when T Rex Tillerson is up for Secretary of State. He comes out with all of these snarky oh, like, yeah. Twitter ready bold. statements and he was like, friend of Vladimir is not what we're looking for at the Secretary. He votes for him. He votes for him. And same thing with McCain. McCain is like, we're going to get to the bottom of this Trump and Russia stuff. You watch me. Mind my words. And he's what was he demanding at the time? He was demanding that there be an independent select committee looking into this. Not just the Republicans investigating it, but an independent 9-11 style commission. And then Mitch McConnell came to him, his top Senate Republican, and was like, John, we don't want that. And then McCain was like, okay, so I'm no longer asking for that, but I want you to know that I'm really principled on this matter. So all he does is get people to be like, oh, that's nice, look what he said. But and then he never actually does it. John McCain it. didn't vote against any of the, he, he, he cast one vote against one Trump nominee. It was Mick Mulvaney for budget director, and he was the only vote against it. It had no consequence. That's the only actual thing he's done, and it had no consequence whatsoever. Rachel, we are so uh, thankful that we get to see you every once in a while and talk about this stuff. Thank. I feel like I'm your little dark cloud. No, like you're dark cloud. You are a shining ray of light. You come, you break it down, you make our stomachs hurt. And yes. We, and we want more. Yes. We want you to come back well, for more. In a few months, we'll bother you again and do it again. I'll bring you some Pepto when I come. All right. Every, every single night on MSNBC. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, you guys. Love right, you. Cheers. Thank you, Rachel.